Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and I'm here today, Friday, for the Friday Conversation with some some friends. I'm still surprised that I was able to get all of you on the same stream all together. But uh, Clayton, you want to start us off with an introduction? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. Ah, it feels like work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm Clayton Snyder. I, I have written a slew of books. My most recent being Blackthorn. Um, and that is that is about it. <laughs> yes. Mark. <laughs> well, my name is Mark, and I run the Slowly Red channel where I review books, mostly dark fantasy or what a lot of people call grim dark and some sci-fi and stuff. I tried to cover horror, but I have a horrible luck with it. But hmm. I read and review books. Nice. And whoever you are in the corner, don't Oh, right. That's me. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, Michael R. Fletcher, author of also a slew of books, much like Clayton, including one with Clayton. Uh, and Rilska Groans, uh, several series, Obsidian Path, City of Sacrifice, Manifest Delusions. And probably something else I can't remember because it's Friday night. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Clayton, I want to tell you congratulations on Blackthorn. Uh, it was released this week, right? Uh, recently, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what's paperback. it about? Uh, what's it about? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, it's kind of a mashup of of the Rock meets um, Necromancy meets Bug Tech, um, kind of cyberpunk, but with bugs. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 very. I, I basically just took all of these ideas and smashed them together until I had a story. It's freaking cool. Uh, I yeah, got to, it's, it's badass. I got to beta read it. It's a yeah, it's a badass book. And Mark, you have a review, right? Yeah, I do have a review up for it. That is ser That is my favorite uh, book of Clayton's. Like, of course, I'm I'm a huge fan of your guys' work together. Norielska Groans is fucking amazing. Uh, but as far as your solo stuff, Clayton, and I really loved <laughs> River of Thieves. Uh, but, but yeah, this was impressive. You know, it was just it had me sucked in from beginning to end, and it never let me go. It never disappointed me. I just had a lot of fun reading it it was just it was awesome it had it had some of that stuff that i feel is almost becoming like a like a clayton snyder staple like there's certain things that are very i feel like after reading a couple of your books that are very you in there but i also feel like there's some newer stuff as well i feel like you, you've kind of approached some uh different angles that I ha at least i haven't seen yet which took me by a little bit by surprise uh which was good and uh yeah just the crazy fucking mix mesh of, of like genres and stuff was so perfectly up my alley you know <laughs> for anybody into weird stuff they are like there's this thing is just it's it's gift wrapped for you it's such a pleasant fucking pleasant read the the some of the stuff man i'm not even sure <laughs> how you even came up with it but it was appreciated on my end reading about it Especially some of the like the witchcraft, like kind of body horror magic stuff was just bonkers and cool. Yeah, I, you know, I <clears throat> Mike, I owe, I owe Mike a big uh, a big chunk of how well that that book has been received because I think uh, two things he was constantly shouting at me while he was beta, beta reading it, and one, one was more, always more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> more of the weird, more of the bugs, more of the the tech. Um, and the other was, I have a tendency to kind of, it's it's a, it's a thing I like to call a get there, and you, and you just go from point A to point B, and there's really nothing in between, and he he really kind of forced me to, actually expand on a lot of those sections and and build the story up, so. Yeah, the end the end product uh, turned out very well. Uh, I mean, there were there were changes. I think you you made more. You kept working on it after the last uh, read I did. Uh, so like the final version is is different again from the last thing I saw. And yeah, and I, I rewrote cool. that ending. Yeah, yeah. I rewrote that ending probably three times. So that's yeah. Every <clears> fucking book for me is I, I write the ending three or four times before I'm actually like, 
There we go. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed the ending. I think as just like a reader, and when I think about like a general audience, I think you might get some people that like, it might like hit them in a, in a weird way or whatever. But for me, it was perfect. It was a perfect ending to that story. Um, and maybe, and also once again, it's kind of a surprising one, I guess, in a way, uh, for me, because I, I, I'm to say, like, I thought I kind of had some stuff figured out, and by the end, I was just like completely wrong, and I was like, oh, fuck, <laughs> man, this is good, and, and, and in a way too, I got to like the ending became very cinematic for me because of the way it hit. I just really could see it, it I could envision it, I was there, and it fucking made it that much cooler, man. It awesome. was it was dope. It was a real like I can't really applaud that book enough, man. I mean, is it the perfect book? No, because there's certain things I think you gotta kind of sacrifice. It's like it's like you're saying with the pacing. Like you're you you're like you ha do have like a bullet train pacing, right? Yeah. And I I get it because I'm like myself. I'm not. I'm just trying to write something. I'm constantly going straight from one thing to the next. There's no nuance in between. <laughs> it's tough. It's uh, it's uh, that's there's a lot of work for the in between, um, but either way, I feel like there wasn't such a like a lack of depth. There was still plenty there to stand on while we were moving along fast. You know, I I just was it was a bravo bravo for me, man. Awesome, yeah, yeah. It's the perfect book. I mean, that is I, I hear that term so often. Like, oh, it's not perfect, but. Like what the fuck is, and that those in between scenes, that's hard. That's a you've got this tiny window, of, in between like you haven't given them enough information, and oh fuck, this is dragging, mm -hmm. and so and nailing that. And if you're you're working on your own uh, book now, right, Mark? Like you're you're yeah, I'm starting on my own story. I, I you are going to discover. Her, but I'm back at exactly. it again. Exactly. Once once people start the like the feedback starts coming in, you're and it's like ah. Oh, yeah, it seems yeah, like the yeah, hardest yeah. thing is always what's what's too much, or you know what's not enough, and it's it's finding that. Yeah, exactly. That There's that if you're constantly fighting for a balance because you know that's what's probably good writing. Good writing is probably, <laughs> probably. more probably. I don't know. I'm not a good fucking writer, so I can't tell you what good writing is. But I imagine it's more balanced than it is swaying one side to the other. You know, mm -hmm. it's not as heavy handed. And it just flows good and stuff. You know, you're fucking shit. But yeah. And you've got, it, you've it got your. Tough. It's tough to know when to rein it in, when to blast them with some fancy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, cause you're saying, Mike, you don't want to fucking, you don't want to bore them. You don't want to bore them. But then, you know what I mean? How much of the fancy can you do to entertain them? And then how much fancy is going to bore them? There's so many things that start, you start thinking about and you're like, fuck me. How do I even write this fucking cock? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can do an entire chapter of two people talking about boots and people will love it. Mm. If you nail it or people are going to be like, what the fuck is happening? Like he has lost the fucking plot. He's just, <laughs> this is just filler bullshit. And the, the annoying, the difficult part is like, what you're going to get is both. You're going to write your chapter of two people sitting in a dark room talking about boots. Um, and like half the people are going to be like, this is fucking amazing. That was the best chapter. It was just a conversation. and I loved it. And the other half are going to be like, this book is all filler bullshit. And you're like, okay, so I, I guess it's both. And then I think about Pratchett when you bring up boots and he's got the whole Sam Vine theory of boots and oh my god, I, I you know, he 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 pretty much nailed that. You know, there's there's you could look at a, a discussion about economics and boots and, and just kind of roll your eyes, but somehow he made it entertaining, and that's that was that's the sweet spot you're always shooting for. Yeah. At least where boots are concerned. Right. <laughs> uh, David had a comment. Based on today's guests, I'm guessing you guys are going to talk about cozy slice of life fantasy stories, right? That's, that's what we're here for. Yep. Yeah. Bugs and cuddles. Yeah. It's like, oh, let's all go down the pub and have a pint. <laughs> sort out a problem like gentlemen. <laughs> and, uh, Madison. And, and Mark, uh, you had your some hardware failure. What was that like to to lose all of your progress on what you've been writing? 
Oh. Uh, it was super, um, super, it just like it killed my spirit, man. It killed my spirit. Um, and it sucks. I don't know how else to explain it. It was just because I guess in the way now I'm, I'm kind of getting back on the, on the horse. Right. But it, it took a lot of talk, like coaching myself kind of to do it. Cause when I was first writing it, there was this kind of in the way, I guess I was writing it. It was very discovery, very in the moment, but I'd also spend a lot of time writing it in a way that it flowed, right? So I guess in a way, some somewhat of my story felt more important that it just f flowed better. That it, that mattered more than the plot, than anything else. It was just like, while you read it, does it just kind of like fucking sound cool? Does it just flow off the tongue? Does it have this like feel to it? That was really like important to me. And I feel like uh, I just lost so much of these like moments that I'll probably never remember because it was just very in the moment feeling it, you know, doing, and then it's gone. It's gone. And I know that there are some of those like pieces that I really liked. The cool part, I guess, you know, now that I'm like back on it, I'm just like trying to find silver linings and stuff is the fact that I know so much of my story now. Sure, it's not like going to be this flowy thing, but I'm also going back and changing a lot. And I'm not, that's not actually the most important thing to me anymore. And I'm <laughs> like, trying to spend more effort into my characters and what's going on and all that. So I'm trying to like uh, not, not just, re you know, dazzle people with my amazing writing that I don't have, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it sucks. And, and I would say, I mean, mm -hmm. For anybody that might have have that same instance happen to them, I would say, you know, as much as that sucks, don't give up. You know what I mean? Just, you know, if you have to, like me, take a break. Just step away from it for a second. And then if you can't, you know, if like if you can't get to it, just keep taking a break. Yep. And set up your word processor to autosave to Dropbox or OneDrive or something like that. Dad do what you need to do to avoid that because uh i i have lost chunks of text like that back in the day yeah uh, i I'm, I'm absolutely paranoid about it i have dropbox and an external drive i throw everything into so i have duplicates of everything yeah and it's it i mean it eats up a ton of space but at the same time it's like oh thank god it's still there yeah so. remember uh 2008 when i started writing uh, basically, like every couple of days, I would email myself the book mm. um, so that it was always in there. And because that there was no, I had no OneDrive, Dropbox options back then, or at least none that I was aware of. So I just, you know, like a million emails from me to me with like <laughs> fragments of my book in them. Like, ah. <laughs> Did you do some of the whole book or just chapters? yourself uh back in those days 2008 uh, that was writing uh, ghosts of tomorrow uh every chapter was its own document uh because i think my computer was kind of like not super happy at 120,000 words you know shit was bogging down and it just worked better as a separate separate things later you know pace of technology and all that it's way easier now yeah for sure I'll tell you one thing that uh, one thing also that came out of this when when I just the feeling that I felt, I guess it, it really, really put me in this position where I, I guess I really understood part of your situation, Mike, with just with publishing and how you said like the wind was taken out of your sails. You know what I mean? About the th last manifest book and kind of taking your time to write it when it's the right time or when it, you know, when it feels right and everything's clicking, you know what I mean? That might be a hard pill for a fan to swallow, but after losing chunk of my own writing and getting just, you know, feeling like the shit got kicked out of me, I understood what you like that, what you had said more than, and, you know, I was just like, dude, I get it. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I set myself up for it, you know, so I, I get that I'm to blame. Uh, but you know, when, when Harper Voyager picked up beyond redemption, uh, and I started seeing all these kind of rave reviews and the book was on all these like best of the year lists. Um, I assumed naively that, um, reviews like that kind of equated directly to sales. Uh, and I was like, for sure. I mean, like, look, it's like on 
it's over a dozen best of the year lists. Like they're going to pick up the second book. They're going to want this standalone I'm writing. It's going to be amazing. And I was just all in. Uh, and then to have them go, yeah, you know what? You know, sales kind of tanking. Uh, we're just, you know, it's, there's, there's not a, it's, we're not selling enough to warrant another book in this world. Um, and, and originally it was sold as a standalone, like it wasn't a trilogy deal or anything. It's not like they scrapped a deal. It was purchased as a standalone. And, um, you know, I, I was just like, there's going to be more. Um, yeah. So when, when that sort of fell apart and I went from thinking I was going to be like a writer to, um, thinking that I was going to be working in a warehouse job for the rest of my life and, um, you know, it kind of felt like I was, that was it. I was done. Like that was my chance. Um, I didn't know anything about self-publishing at the time. Uh, so I, I didn't really understand how much of an option that was and how viable. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm glad I did not sort of like cave, but yeah, it was a shit kicking. <laughs> I can imagine, man. I can imagine like what I went through. I'm like, this is like nothing compared to what you fucking had to go through, you know? Uh, losing work is hard that that is seriously painful though it's there's no you can't kind of like oh i'll just write the same scenes and yeah, much of the same dialogue really it doesn't like work that. no it doesn't it's work. not the same and some sometimes writing can be a kind of it sounds cheesy but it can be like a very intimate process yep. you know what i mean and so you write a line or maybe even a paragraph shit maybe a, if you're lucky a couple pages that just for some reason really resonate with your soul and your fucking your your you're really digging what you're doing. It helps you kind of propel you into the next bit of writing, right? You're like, fuck yeah, I'm feeling this. I'm, 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 I'm on the right track, you know? <laughs> it all yeah. goes up in smoke and you're like, Phew. oh, I don't know how to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You try and rewrite that scene from memory and it's just, no nope. magic's gone. It's And the problem and is, a... is, yeah, there's that negativity of it just disappearing on you that kind of fucks with your creativity. So you're trying to even get in the space and it's like you're, you're that thing is nagging you in the back of the head and it's kind of throwing sticks on your, you know, while you're trying to dance on the floor and stuff. You're fucking sucks. But I think I've taken quite a break, quite a break. And I'm gearing up to move as well as getting into the winter time here in Alaska. So I'm just prime isolation time. So, so. <laughs> if it was ever going to start getting pumped out, it's now. So yeah. Hopefully we'll see. I'm, I'm getting right going through it all. I've just about gotten to the point uh, where I've, you know, where I, what I have left of what I've saved about half of the story got fucking lost, but it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, a question from Darren. Darren, thank you. This uh, very nice view. Uh, this is an all-star crew right here. Question for Fletcher. Will there be an audiobook for an end to sorrow? Uh, yep, there will be. It is actually being recorded at this very moment. Um, hmm. Uh, so I think goal is released sometime in September. But there, Wait, there you were. already do you already have audiobooks for the other two? Yep. Fuck. I guess I need to buy. <laughs> I guess I need to buy them. I mean, I don't listen to audiobooks as much as I read. You know what I mean? But I like to support my dudes. Whenever I uh, whenever I think about audiobooks, I think about. But uh, what Clayton must have told the reader of River of Thieves when he was read that book. Oh, that was a weird situation because he, he actually contacted me and, and wanted to read the book. And I said, uh, all right. <laughs> and then I never heard from him again after he did the, the job. So. <laughs> I'm assuming it maybe scarred him a little. but <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That'll teach him. It's so just <laughs> z that's the the funniest shit I think I've ever read in a fantasy novel in that book. <laughs> For sure. And Clayton, what's it like to to work so hard on your book and then have it released? What's what's the what is release day like as an author to have your book out there? Uh it's it's this weird cross of relief and total nightmare. Because then you start thinking about all the things you might have screwed up in the book or anything, even right down to typos. But it's like bigger stuff, you know, uh, is, is the plot right? You know, I've read this thing 40, 450 times. Is the plot still right? Um, <clears throat> you know, is is did I name a character something stupid? Did, just all kinds of garbage that goes into your head with, when it goes out. 
and you're just waiting. You kind of hold your breath until you get those first couple of reviews because you just don't know how it's going to go. I mean, it, it's it's a flip of a coin sometimes. So, but at the same time, it's like, oh, thank God I don't have to read this thing anymore. I don't have to work on it anymore. It's just gone. It's not my problem. So, <laughs> if there is a mistake, you can go back and, and fix it, right? As a, if you. Yeah, I, I mean, as as a, as an independent author, that's that's super easy to do. Um, you know, obviously, if, if you're with a house, you're you're pretty much screwed. That's that's indelible at that point. So, yeah, there's a there's a weird anti climax to releasing books at kind of at different levels. Um, like I just I sent a book off to my editor, and I was like crazy excited about this book it's different I've, I've never done anything like this before uh, my beta readers are like this is crazy i have plans to try shopping at the agents and stuff and i send it to my editor and i'm crazy excited about it and literally the next day i can't write because i'm just kind of like <laughs> <sighs> yep. do i hear somebody yelling out there i might have to go check on a small human I will be back in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got those problems too. <laughs> yeah. No, Mike's right though. I mean, there's at a certain point, there's a, there's this anticlimax. It's almost like your soul just leaves your body for a while. Like it's, it's got to go on vacation. <laughs> so, I, oh, I wanted to ask Mark, uh, what's what's your book about? So uh, basically, so what happened was it, it kind of is basically how I'm writing at this point is I just get an idea and I go off of that. I don't have like a, like do a bunch of plotting or anything like that. So I kind of get a wild idea and I decide to run with it. <clears throat> and I had a couple ideas and I was running with a couple and I just kept running in a lot of problems, mostly with explaining my crazy world building. Um, so then I kept trying to simplify, simplify. And eventually i i got this wild idea to write a story my main characters were based off of mickey and mallory knox from natural born killers okay because i was like i wanted to do like a grim a love story but like a dark fan fucked up love story you know <laughs> and uh i i love for some reason i love that kind of duo because i love mickey and mallory knox i like bonnie and clyde uh i like joker harley quinn kind of like deal or another one another and these are this is another group that i kind of sprinkled into my characters is that the couple in pulp fiction that are at the restaurant honey bunny and the other and tim roth or whatever you know that that are just constantly calling each other sweet names and stuff so the care like i the whole concept of this this fucking book is these two are in love uh and they're it's kind of like one of those deals <laughs> The, the chick is not a human. She's a sword. She's, <laughs> she's a magical sword. And her, the guy is a ghost. So it's a ghost and his sword who are, and they're married. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you gotta love trying to explain your own crazy bullshit. Basically right. they're being somewhat being chased. Uh, or you could say that they're leading the, their fucking pursuers on a chase through treacherous lands from one end to the other of this world. Uh, which is just called the Ark because it's just a small chunk of land. There's basically been a flood and all it's left is like a little tiny island basically in the world and they call it the Ark. And uh, so it's a, the adventures of a fucked up couple from one end to the other of the Ark. <laughs> but in this, it just gave me a lot of opportunity to play with. It's very high fan. I say it's kind of like Natural Born Killers meets Princess Bride because it's fucked up, but it's also super funny and ridiculous at times. Uh, and it's really uh, a lot of times it seems to be a mix mesh of just all the people I love, like their right, like their stuff. You know what I mean? There's little things like all I notice it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I totally got this from this person. <laughs> 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 or sometimes you might get an idea that you're like, I love this person's story and their world, but I wish they would have put this in it. Well, now's mm -hmm. your chance to kind of go out and do that with your own shit, you know? Right. In all honesty, this whole thing, every, my, all the writing and all that shit that I've done, it all came out of the thing that I wish that Mark Lawrence would have put a plane in, in the Broken Empire. 
Uh, Cause I think that he could have had a lot of fun with that kind of deal, just because the way that the world is and stuff, people would have been very confused about what it was. And, shit. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, so, and that could spark this thing. And I, I was like, well, shit, man, if you get these crazy ideas, I guess you could just start writing. You know, and I sent Mike a chunk of my, like the very first thing I wrote and it was horrible. It was God awful. Uh, but you know what I mean? <laughs> he, he helped like kind of put some things in perspective and, and at least gave me a, like some good feedback. And I was able to start writing from there. I've since scrapped that story. Uh, and then I started on this one. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm planning on it just being a standalone story. So it's going to be, uh, it's supposed to be kind of a fun, dark fantasy adventure uh, that really touches on the fucked up parts of love, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And uh, Lana said, just purchased Blackthorn. Thank you, Lana. Is there going to be an audio for that or and a hardcover? Uh, maybe naked. Yes, there, there, there will more than likely be uh, a naked hardcover for it. As far as audio, I have no idea. Um, that usually is something that happens about, for me, if it, if it happens at all, about a year, two years down the road. So, it must be tough finding it, finding a narrator because it's so it's so time consuming. And it must well, it's it's yeah. also kind of dependent on budget. Um, it's it's harder to find a narrator that wants to do split profits or um you know maybe just take half and half and that sort of thing uh so it's in the past i've done acx uh and it worked out okay but i i like i said i, I kind of feel bad for the narrator because i don't think i i've sold all that many copies of audio for river of thieves so neither of us are i, I my last statement i think was ten dollars so <laughs> it's uh you know it's not really going out there um <clears throat> But yeah, it's it's uh, it's just one of those things. So everybody, go out there and get a copy of uh, River of Thieves, the audiobook. It's well worth yeah. your time. It's hilarious. audio is a weird thing. Like I've got writer friends who audio is like half or even more than half of their income, and it's audio is huge for them. And I mean, for me, like audio, it's an afterthought. It's this, like like Clayton, this this tiny percentage. Yep. You know, it's like, and I kind of like, oh, are you gonna do an audio book? And like, like, yeah, I guess, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> but you know, it's certainly not compared to uh, like ebooks and KU, it's it ain't nothing, yo. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, Kindle Unlimited is pretty much my best friend when it comes to actual sales and hmm. and getting reads out there and getting people, eyes on the book, so. Yeah, it's it's funny because some people say that they really love Kindle Unlimited for that reason for page reads, and some people say that it's not so great and they prefer just to sell the ebook. Um, strange how that you know. I wonder it's because it's based off of page reads, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I make about the same if someone buys the ebook or if they read it on Ku. Yeah, um, I make about the same amount, so I'm kind of like, all right, whatever. <laughs> you know, however is convenient to you, like go for that. Unless you're pirating it off one of those sites, in which case, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of, of pirating, it's something that I've I didn't even know you could do. This is people have been buying ebooks and then asking for a refund. Is that common that that happens? Uh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, ebooks. It does happen. I, not a lot. Uh, happens more with audio, from what I've seen. Hmm. Um, ACX slash Audible. They seem to have a system where it's like you know, a month later, you can kind of return the book and get a full refund. And then they just, they just yank that, that sale off your uh, royalties. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, apparently there was some video going around like, Ooh, you know, audiobook hack, here's how to listen to unlimited audiobooks. And so people were quite excited about that. It's like, yeah, that's great. Might also, you know, kind of contribute to why audiobooks are this afterthought for some of us. Yeah. Wow. A month later, they can wow. something like I, I I never bothered looking into the details because, like I said, audio is just it's not huge for me. Yeah, you know it's it's nice, it's a little bonus, but um, wow. yeah, yeah. I mean that? that Audible thing for sure. I don't know about other uh, 
other audiobook like services or whatever but i know at least with audible and their at least the way it was was very much where people could just you know get a audiobook listen to it and then return it or whatever and like cancel it or whatever you know what i mean and then just get a new use that credit and then boom on they get their next audiobook and then they just do the same thing after they finish that one so they use one credit and they read you know 10 15 audiobooks or whatever off the one credit and i understand what they're doing there's you know they're being cheap and they're trying to save their money or whatever but yes like a lot of times it's these people are really have no idea like the repercussions they're doing to everybody all the people that went in and worked on that stuff that they're enjoying are really getting screwed by them being cheap. Look, I'm all about fucking the system, but I mean, at the same time, man, like <laughs> fuck creative, those artists. Creatives got to get paid guys. Otherwise you're going to be really fucking bored. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lana said it was on TikTok. I blew up that comment section with my venom. So mad. <laughs> nice. Awesome. <laughs> yeah it's called theft yeah how was um how was that third uh manifest delusions book coming along mike uh slowly it's it's moving and so what's going on uh we haven't really sort of publicly talked about it much but um clayton is doing a co-write with me oh, nice. um and so because uh like norilska groans worked so well uh and i know if there's one person who can write crazy it's definitely Clayton. Um, <laughs> we, we split the characters down the middle. We basically, uh, it was like picking sides for a dodgeball team. Like I'll take witch dick. I'll take Stalin. Uh, and we, uh, we basically split all the characters up. Um, and, uh, very similar kind of approach, just slower because we've both got other shit going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so the book will, I think be called a war to end all. Um, and much like Beyond Redemption at the end, I don't think anyone's going to be confused. Um, but, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's slow, but it's coming. I'm hoping it drops sometime in 2023. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, like I said, like we both got our other books going on, so it's, it's a slow, it's a slow grind. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, with, with Blackthorn being off my plate now, I, th I think I'm going to start or I'm going to have time now to to actually start investing in in writing my chunks of the book and and kind of getting that off the ground. So, yeah, same yeah. with a uh, the latest thing off to the editor. I, I have fewer excuses. <laughs> when uh, so when you before you picked teams, did you have an ending in mind that you you both were like agreed upon, or are you just kind of seen where it comes uh, together? We, we have an ending we have decided upon. Um, we don't know how we're going to get there yet. We'll, we'll kind of uh, three chapters at a time, much, much like the way we did Norilska, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, but we know how it's going to end and it's going to be a colossal clusterfuck. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is also going to be a bit of a chunk of a book at this rate. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a, it's going to be a chunky one. Just when I thought I couldn't be more excited for this book, <laughs> the two of you working together. That's awesome. That's, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's been good so far. It's a, it's really good having another person to bounce ideas off for stuff like this. And even with other projects, like, um, you know, it started with Norilska, but since then, like Clayton and I, you know, on our own stuff are constantly just, bombing each other with uh with messages talking about book stuff and it's like oh yeah 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 cool and then we we both get excited about an idea and sort of chase it down and you know out of that falls you know more story stuff so it's yeah. it has been it's been very useful yeah i tortured him for about half the afternoon with a sci-fi idea i had so yeah that one's gonna be crazy <laughs> some more collaborations in the future huh yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, we got there's a lot going on. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. There's there's too many books. I you know I, I want to write. I want three. I got three, four, four books that I want to be writing right now and finishing. But that's not the way time works. Yeah. Yeah, Fortunately, that's something. I'm wondering. I noticed just with with in writing a little bit that I have is like 
ideas for other things start to pop up and sometimes at such an intense rate like i'm like dude in the last month thought of like seven different fucking stories <laughs> like, yeah it's your subconscious even, trying to sabotage any, you that's it i think exactly what it is because i'm like i know what this is it's trying to get me to fucking bail on what i'm writing and start this other motherfucker yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> And it's, it's like, got fuck. more, and it's got even more on deck, so I can bail on that one. <laughs> yep. There's like chase the new shiny thing. Yep. God damn it. Yeah. Well, look, I actually have a way of dealing with that. Um, I was gonna which ask. is which is just to ignore them. Ignore them, and if if one of them keeps coming back, that's the one that wants to be written. But other than that, the other stuff is probably just fleeting. It doesn't really have any meaning. It's just your brain spinning out other stuff. Um, but if one keeps coming back, that's the one that wants to be written. And that's the one that you need to actually, you know, kind of hunker down and start spending your time on when you're done with the current project. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. M much the same. I never take notes when I have a story idea I never write any of them down. And yeah. that's my sort of litmus test. If I can't remember it a week later, it was a shitty idea. If three months later, I'm still struggling with it and it's still clawing at me. Then I'll start world building it in the background while I finish the book I'm working on. Yep. But it's it's got to survive. The, the The story idea has to basically haunt me for months before <laughs> I'm like, ah, fuck, fine. I will write you. Uh, Gabriel, so the, the Obsidian Path Omnibus will be available, available for purchase and all the ladies will be uh, excited and all the boys will also be excited. <laughs> 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 yes, plenty of excitement. <laughs> yeah, a lot of excitement. Uh, Sean says Colossal Clusterfuck would be a great book title. Uh, the Colossal Clusterfucks. Hey, Nick. <laughs> uh. <Sorry. laughs> yeah. So many obsidians. There was a lot of obsidians. So. There was. That was Obsidian Psalm was uh, why we ended up writing uh, Neuralska Groans. Uh, because uh, I saw Clayton on Facebook and was like, Caught, you know, oh, new release Obsidian Psalm. I was like, what the fuck is this? That sounds like that sounds like my book. What the fuck is going on? So I bought it and read it and was like, this is insane. We should do something together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've never been able to really recreate that book. I don't know what kind of fugue state I was in, but holy shit. So, <laughs> so was that your first for both of you? Was that your first collaboration? Yeah. Yeah, it was for me. Yep, I haven't. Uh, Neuroska was yes. Yep. Okay. What was that whole process like? Was that weird to be sharing your your space with someone else and taking you know go back and forth, or what was that like? Not not really. It, it felt pretty natural. I mean, we 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 have a similar process for the most part, and uh, you know our, our writing styles aren't. Mike's Mike's easily the better writer, but our, our writing styles aren't so diverse that that we could kind of make them gel and, and the same thing with our work ethic. So it all just kind of, it, it just felt natural and it worked really well. So yeah. <laughs> like we have the same work ethic, bad. <laughs> yeah, hey, true. <laughs> so. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think part of what made it easy, uh, easier was that we, we edited each other's chapters, yeah. uh, which really helped mm. give the thing a, a cohesive feel. Um, you know, so we basically each, we each tried to make the other guy write more like us. And, um, you know, in the end, we, we sort of ended up in this, you know, something that, that kind of worked. Yep. But that, that was a really cool experience. I think that was the first book, um, because we were, we didn't know how to plot something together. Uh, we sort of settled on this. We'll do three chapters at a time kind of thing. Yeah. And after that, it stuck with me. It was like, oh shit, this is actually like a really good way to just write a book like kind of know how you want it to end but get there three chapters at a time so you've still got room to be organic and to to follow like if something pops up and you're like oh fuck this is really cool yep. you, you've still got room to chase that yeah and it wasn't it wasn't like the the chapters were super rigidly structured we knew um like there were beats we wanted to hit but everything within those chapters was pretty much fair game outside of those beats so yeah well as as a reader 
who had read both of your guys' stuff before reading Norelska Groans. I fucking say that it was a, an amazing collaboration because it felt like one person wrote it. It doesn't feel like two guys came out. It feels like one mind. Uh, and also, it was impressive because I couldn't really figure out who had wrote which part. I really couldn't like cl clearly be like this was flat, you know, this was yeah. Clayton, it, Dude, and that impressed me because it was like a really good fucking show of teamwork, you know, yeah. and, and chemistry, you know, and that not all it doesn't always go that way, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Clayton says that I'm the better writer, but half the people don't know who wrote what. Half half the people <laughs> that half the reviews I see that, got it wrong, so I don't think I am. That, and it, I, it, I look that, at reviews and. Most of the lines people are quoting are Clayton's when they're like, ah, oh, like this line landed. This is a beautiful line. Those are his. Yeah. Also, the stuff that squicked him out was mostly mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the scenes that, that broke people, those were also his. <laughs> those were so good, though. <laughs> oh, old Durkles. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> what is that like for an author to to for someone to say that you, something you wrote broke them or they they had a you know they couldn't continue uh you know i think those are two different things um it's it's one thing for them to say oh god this thing broke me but i loved it and then um you know because you kind of get that little wee i did something right uh on the other hand it's uh you know when they say i can't continue it's just like ah shit i pushed it too far and so you know that those people should have read the first version of that torture scene holy fuck <laughs> oh my god he's like oh dude what do you think of that and i'm like i was really fucking uncomfortable <laughs> that first yep. version it was like <laughs> two words banana split oh jesus okay yeah Uh, Gabriel says, uh, and Mike uh, makes kick-ass music from his own books. So a person shouldn't be this cool. Yeah, this person's a huge nerd, but thank you. <laughs> the music is fun. How do you have? How do you find time to do to make music too? You're writing what three or four books, and you're making music too. Yeah, music usually happens like on the weekends or evenings. Um, I kind of writing time usually stops around like four or five o'clock. Uh, and so uh, what I'll often do is I'll open up the, my, uh, recording software. It's like just open in the background, uh, on the computer. So, you know, when I have an idea, I will grab a guitar, lay down a riff. And so I, I might spend weeks, uh, you know, building like a four minute death metal track kind of thing. Is there anything you do, uh, Clayton, while you're writing, that's something else that kind of off to the side that you go to when you need a little break yeah i uh i tried playing guitar and i suck at it so i went to um electronics <laughs> i uh i build little tiny electronic things um you know right now i'm building a weather station with a touchscreen app and the whole nine yards but yeah it's, it's it's for me that's my relaxation is, is these little hobby electronics and yeah Uh, Nick says if something was getting brutally butchered, it was it was usually Clayton writing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Alana says, "Where do we where do we find said music?" Oh, uh, um, so some of it is on Spotify. Uh, there's three or four tracks there with a singer. Um, the band on Spotify is Blackstone Heart. Uh, I think if you look up Michael R. Fletcher on YouTube, I've put some music up there. And then um, the hell's the other one? SoundCloud. I think Michael R. Fletcher on SoundCloud. There might be a couple of tracks there. I can't remember. It's very much hobby. It's not something I put a lot of thought into or, uh, you know, I'm a tape attempting to make money at it all because I just want it to be fun. It, it has to be zero pressure. Hmm. Yep. And Gary Brillo uh, says, but Clayton has a sexy singing voice. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all the cigarettes and whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> Going for Tom Waits eventually. 
What else do you do, Mark, when you're not uh, reading and doing reviews? Uh, well, I'm a tattoo artist, so it's a weird, it's one of those things where like my job is also like something I like to do. So it kind of like I get a win win there a lot of the times. Though I kind of agree with this this thing. Where it's just like uh, as far as being a creative, you you don't want to feel any pressure, right? Like you want to just be able to do your thing. And that's one thing that, like, you know, as far as tattooing as a job, you're very constrained because you're doing what other people want you to do all the time. And a lot of times they're not flexible either. So you're like, you're, you're, you're not exactly in your flow that you would like to be. But I've always gotten the kick out of just being creative, man, whether it's drawing or writing something, you know, like fucking a silly song or poetry, whatever the fuck, man. Uh, creating has always been an escape for me, I guess, in a way. So I've always dug anything creative, uh, fucking spray paint shit. I mean, all kinds of stuff, dude. Um, mm-hmm. That's just, I guess, the way that I, I, I that's the, just, I'm more of like an artistic soul than anything. You know what I mean? Like I never really got too much into like, like I was never like a gearhead and shit like that. I was always into fucking movies and music and stuff like that, you know? Like the most physical, demanding thing I ever really got into. I was never, never really into sports, but I was really into skateboarding. Like, but that, you know, <laughs> that, that was, you know what I mean? <laughs> but so if I get it. on a skateboard now, I basically just fucking sh- sh- shake and tear. <laughs> it's like they don't want to spend the months healing that it's going to yeah. require. It's going to be a fall I'm off. Gonna, I'm going to die. <laughs> did, I pay, did I pay my premium? Yeah. <laughs> so so mark when when someone walks in your shop and has a terrible idea for a tattoo how do you talk them out of it what is there a, a method oh, you use? well really there's so many bad ideas out there so there's a whole di- bunch of different ways you can approach how their idea is bad you know uh, <laughs> one of the Uh, one of the one of the things that is like notorious with tattooing, especially right now, it's, it's a big fan like fad, is tiny, 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 tiny little dainty tattoos. Hmm. And what people don't understand is these things are not going to age well. They're going to turn into blobs because it, <clears throat> all ink, especially stuff that's not black ink, is going to soften up. So it's basically going to get bigger on you over time, like kind of like you know fan out, so to speak. Uh, so all those tight little lines that are next to each other just all end up bleeding into one another, and you never you don't have this cute little tattoo. You have a blob of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have to tell people that. I mean, some people are like, "I don't care, I don't care." Yes. <laughs> that must be tough to uh, have someone to bring in a turtle, and you kind of feel like you're crushing their dreams, you know, because they have their heart set on something, and you have to tell them. That's a terrible idea. So we'll yeah. just cut out the middle couple of years. And I'm just going to tattoo a blob of shit on you right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I straight up. T- I, mean, cause I feel like it's part of my responsibility as a tattoo artist. Like most of the people don't know this stuff. They just, you know, they see something they like and they want it on their body. And unfortunately, it's just not exactly the way tattooing works. You know, and I didn't even know that shit until I got into it. When I got into tattooing, I realized how how little you can actually do, or at least how little you should do. That doesn't mean people don't attempt these fucking asinine tattoos. Uh, and that's usually when you get the worst ones. Speaking of asinine tattoo ideas, would it be possible to do a sleeve of my three Obsidian Path novel covers? Is that doable or is that insane? Ooh, well... I, like I have no idea. I've got like a couple of tattoos, but they're very blocky, simple things. Okay, so is that nuts? So this one, uh-huh. as crazy as it is, there's some things you'd have to simplify. But this is like a doable tattoo. Thing is, is you'd have to do massive, like you'd have to do it big to get the detail, right? So it's right. gonna have to probably be this goddamn big. On like, so you're already talking about an entire. <laughs> like quarter or half sleeve but you know kind of quarter because it's only covering one part it might even wrap some uh god dang it where's she dreams in blood see i got the matte one this one oh, might have right. been this one is where you're probably gonna fucking run into some trouble because i know the original one right and there's all the crazy shit going on in the background that guy... might be a little tougher 
Little, just little. to get the detail you could do a, you could do it but it'd be more simplified right in my opinion not to say there's not a michelangelo out there that can fucking tattoo crazy shit you know uh and then my uh an into sorrow i have the blue one but it's a boxed up right now um that one man i feel like if you tried to do something like that your best would be go like full back piece <laughs> yeah, that's one thing should- is the the thing is, is with detail, you need the room to put it in there. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. They want a small tattoo. They don't want to cover their whole body. And I get it. But the problem is, is you want all this jazz. And it's like, we can't fit that <laughs> that amount in that small area. You need room. Why the is detail. the sky so hairy? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that one I feel like is doable. There's so much nice, like dark, uh, like blacks in there and nice contrast to work off of your bright colors. Uh, I think you'd have to get, uh, you know, a stone cold killer as a tattoo artist, but it is doable. I think the she dreams and blood cover is the hardest one to pull off. I think that uh, Blackstone heart would be the easier one of them all. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Thanks, man. Just do a full body wrap with the omnibus. Full body wrap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the other one you got here, though, too? This would, like, I feel like if you, you could get him tattooed, but he'd have to be pretty big because of the detail. You know what I mean? Like, I saw somebody get a tattoo of the, I think it's the Mirror's Truth cover. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's actually there's, a pretty decent tattoo. Yep. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen, there's, uh, mirror's truth and i can't remember somebody did something else but i can't remember what it was now but yeah the the mirror's truth guy he actually that's john uh he was in toronto visiting some folks uh we actually he, he messaged me we uh, we ended up meeting at a bar for uh, for a couple of beers it was a very cool evening i figure somebody right. tattoos my book cover on them yeah. i gotta go for a beer yeah, no <laughs> shit. It's like, no, no, I can't meet you for a pint. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm coming for a beer, dude. Yeah. And uh, Lana has a question for Mark. Do you design art for tattoos for people that can't get to you? Uh, no, not really. No, not necessary. I mean, not that I would be, uh, I guess. I don't really get approached about it i guess is really the answer to that that's that's correct because it's not that i'm like no i don't do it i just never been really approached by it i guess one thing is a lot of tattoo artists don't though because a lot of times they only want to design what they're going to do and not what someone else is going to do uh but i mean for me though too is is like if you're paying me for something you're paying me for something i mean if we agree on it then i don't see why what the fucking problem is um you know, but I'm not a, like everybody else though either. So, <laughs> do you have a like a specialty, like a style that you that you love to do? Um, you know, well, uh, my drawing style started as very like cartoonish. Like I, very, I w- always drew cartoons when I was like growing up. I always I was really into comics and stuff. Um, but I realized really quick when I came, got into tattooing that my style wasn't very tattooable. Like I had to relearn how to draw for tattooing. Um, Because I needed to put more space and this and that, you know, certain things just aren't good ideas for tattoos. They don't translate like they do from paper to skin. It just doesn't work that way. So through relearning how to draw, I have actually really fallen in love with a style that I used to hate, which is the like kind of tradition. They call it traditional, but it's kind of like the old school. I would like most people would know it as like old school, like Americana tattoos, you know, like the best way to describe it is like, you know, the fucking mom with a heart or something you know a dagger and a rose and stuff but it looks like a fucking classic tattoo uh i've really fallen in love with that style uh there's something about it that just is so awesome and tough to me uh that i can't get enough of it but it's hilarious because i used to be like that shit is so trash It's funny when you start working into something like how, how your whole feelings about certain things can change, you know? A lot of times it's like I have, you know, my opinion of it. I just didn't really know that much about it. And then when I learned about it, I was like, fuck, this is dope. <laughs> That's why I try to always try to suggest to people to try give it a shot before you condemn it. You know what I mean? 
it's really easy to just write dismiss shit and write it off because it doesn't sound that like your thing but if you you'd be amazed how much how many things out there will surprise you just give them a shot and uh specter sir happy friday fellas Not happy right. friday although the days are all kind of they just blur together now <laughs> <laughs> that they do Yeah, traditional is, is one of those styles when you you don't really know, uh, don't really realize how special it is until you get into it. So it's uh, you start to appreciate it once you learn more about tattooing. You start to appreciate. Yeah, the especially the with the amount of history that's attached to it, though, too. And there's this one thing you start. I guess if you start to, like I said, it all rolls into like under the more you understand tattooing, I get it. The way that those things are drawn, the way that they're designed are so specifically to be tattooed. Like there's a, you know, they're all spaced out. They all have a specific kind of coloring or amount of shading. So like you could see the tattoo from across the room and you know what it is. You, you know, it sticks out. It's boom. That's a fucking, you know, skull and dagger. That's a panther. That's a, you know, <clears throat> And then there's so much history like attached that to these guys that like uh, just you really took the industry from nothing and, and made it into something. So there's just so much to really love and cherish about that that art style. And then I also kind of started to realize as a, like a tattooer, you'll start to see kind of like fads, like tattoo fads pop up and it's like a new the new style. But the funny thing is, is these new styles really do come and go. And you're like, well, no one's even getting that shit no more. But the one style that's stayed through it all is traditional. So it's very aptly named, right? I mean, because it is traditional. It'll always be here. People will always be getting traditional tattoos. And, and, and the new stuff is cool for a moment, you know. Uh, Nick has a question. Tramp stamp butterfly tattoos or not that classic? <laughs> you know what's funny is like most tattoo artists love the lower back tattoo and they hate uh that it's been deemed the tramp stamp because now no one wants to get them because <laughs> the area of the body it's in or because the... yeah but the thing is is the new tramp stamp if you ask me is the under boob tattoo it's the it's like the the, the tattoos they do under their their tits <laughs> like a chandelier or whatever the fuck uh <laughs> You know, it's fuck. It is what it is. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to bag on anybody's tattoos or anything, but it is a de it is the equivalent of the tramp stamp. Hmm. Have you thought about doing uh, book book covers? No, because uh, I mean that's the thing is like even once I finish my own book, I'll probably be I I'll probably be hitting up Felix honestly. <laughs> uh, but 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 because my thing is is at this point, uh, all I the way I draw is like tattoo style so i mean it's it like my cover would look like a tattoo and not so much like a fantasy cover at least that's what i'm thinking you know what i mean so uh i don't think it'll necessarily work for it may it might work on a some some stories but i don't specifically think it would like resonate real well with the story i'm writing right now and also i really like felix's work yeah <laughs> he's been saving up those guys, you, dude, his covers are insane. Insanely yeah, good. Insanely it's good. good. And I already, I was in contact with him a while back, and it sucks that I didn't like kind of like every, all the shit happened, and we've kind of like, you know, I haven't talked to him in a minute, and I'll have to talk to him again once I finally get to it. But the thing is, is I'm imagining the price of where it started and where I'll finally get to him is going to be a sufficient jump up because, and you know, oh, yeah. he deserves it. He deserves it. He's fucking killing it, man. He's got some of the coolest covers out there right now. How, how important is it or how how nerve-wracking is it i guess to pick a cover for clayton and, and mike is is how what, what is that process like is you have to is there like a catalog of covers or do you work with an artist and say this is what my book is about and this is what uh -huh. i want to have or how does that how does it all work i think mike's got more experience in that than i do most of the time i i do a lot of um uh composition work to to build my own covers uh with blackthorn um as far as I know, Felix had an idea and ran with it. <laughs> and when I got it, it was it was gorgeous, and and I really didn't have anything to say. So, yeah, I uh, I I love his work, and and it's impossible really to to not love it. I I haven't run across anybody that's looked at a Felix Ortiz piece and, and went no. So, 
but yeah, Mike's got way more experience with the, as yeah. far as the cover so process. My, my approach um, with Felix and previous artists uh, is uh, I'll pick two or three scenes from the book that I think visually will be striking. Uh, I'll write them down in great sort of detail, um, often cutting pieces out of the book and just do a cut and paste into a document. I'll send them to Felix and say, which one do you think will work best? Which one are you most excited about? Because I want the piece that he's like, yeah, I want to do this. I don't want to push him into doing something that I think is going to be cool, but he's like, eh, I don't really care. You know, <laughs> I want the one he's like, yeah, it's going to be like, this is going to be amazing. Um, and so he picks of which scene he wants to do. And I just, I trust him. Um, we will bounce back, back and forth, like sort of nailing additional details because even with a, you know, a, a scene description, he'll come back and be like, yeah, but you know, what's his hair like? Is it shoulder length? Is it longer? Um, you know, describe, describe these giants. What, what, do, what do they look like, you know, in, in more detail? And so like for me, all of my covers are, they're always a scene from the book. Um, and you know, it's not a case of like, ah, oh, flip through the catalog and go, oh, I like that cover. I'll buy that. It's, I work hand in hand with the artist to sort of create that scene. Um, and even, even near the end, uh, because of the way Felix works and, you know, modern sort of a digital graphic stuff, everything's done in layers. So, you know, I can be like, you know what, that architecture for the city in the background it's not really working for what I had in mind. I need something blockier or more, you know, like more of a um, battlement sort of aesthetic. Uh, and he will go in and just be like, okay, here, I've redone the city in the background. And we'll do shit like, like you can kind of see it, that guy there. We'll do shit like um, eh, red flames on the sword. How about green flames? What if they're kind of a sickly blue? And he'll just pop them off and... Uh, you know, change the colors with magic art thing skills, <laughs> which I don't understand or know anything about. Uh, but that, but that's it. And then at the end, he sends me an invoice, and I'm like, no, fuck. <laughs> and, uh, Gabriel says, I'm working on my own story, too. Let's trade reviews in the future, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Uh, I love cover and that scene from the book. Yeah, me too. I, I always, if I read a book and then I stop and look at the cover and I'm like, what the fuck is this? I hate that. I I want to, I want to be reading and go, Oh shit, this is that moment. And then flip back to the cover and look at it and be like, yeah, fuck, that's cool. And I don't know. It helps. It helps put me in there. I don't know. It, it speaks of a level of effort. I think, you know, that's sort of a above and beyond, here I put something pretty, you know, that, that shit pisses me off. You're like, here's a super cool cover that has nothing to do with the book. And you bought it for the super cool <laughs> cover because let's face it, super cool covers sell books. And then you read, read the story and you're like, eh, that wasn't, that wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. Spectre says I was always a fan of, of action scenes on book covers, like the second before the violence. Uh, Clayton, what did you think of Felix's 4 a.m. Uh, I'm black and white artwork. I, uh, oh man, I love that thing. Uh, <laughs> I have gone back and looked at it probably 400 times. It's, it's just a perfect piece and it, it really is. It, it just captures that, that, that one moment from that book just perfectly. So it's like, uh, honestly, it's like he was in my head when he went and drew that. So. Yeah, I have I have no complaints. <laughs> how far is he backed up? If you wanted to get a book cover, how long would the wait be? Uh, I'm not sure now. I tend to book him when I think um, that uh, I'm definitely going to finish the book. That's when I book him. Um, so, like you know, if if I'm six a month six months away from the release, I'll, I'll sort of uh, reach out and start talking about you know, his schedule six months down the road and can he fit this in? And because I like, I, I refuse to get caught up and, you know, backlogged or stuck in a corner with this shit. You know, I, I don't, I don't need that kind of stress on top of everything else. 
Um, but yeah, I, w- I would say at least six months. And then he has up and down periods. Like I, I, there was at least once where he was um, like, like into 12 months booked. Um, but I, again, it's, I don't know if it's seasonal or just the up and down of the biz, but it really, really depends. Uh, I love re- I love reaching a scene in the books that in the book that's on the cover. Yep, hard right, same. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's uh, to me it's a cool scene on the cover. I'm like, I guess I want to read that scene. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alden's here. I agree about covers. I, uh, I expect the cover to relate to the story. So Clayton, how how on on point is your Blackthorn cover to the story in the book? It's solid. Um... Yeah, there's there's uh, there's very little deviance um, between the story and the cover as far as the look of the of the Blackthorn mercenaries, the, the look of the mechs, um, you know that kind of. I I, I, I love the orange filter you used because it reminds me of Michael Bay. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's it's and it's it's very that 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 story very much has that flavor. It's it's you know explosions and running and shooting and and yeah so it, it worked for me really well let me see if i can pull this up so everybody who hasn't seen the cover I definitely can... got that michael bay vibe for sure <laughs> it, it is action-packed in the bet you know in the fucking best ways yeah 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 that's oh, a great cover oh yeah, fuck yeah how dope. sexy is that that's so dope yeah he did an amazing job as a, a blur from someone on the front, I've never heard of. Yeah, <laughs> some hack. <laughs> they woke some bum up in an alleyway and just was like, "Hey, say something about this book. <laughs> yeah. Say something nice about my book." Yeah, it's a great risky. cover. And while shaking a little bottle of schnapps, like this teasing. <laughs> uh, peach schnapps, flashbacks to high school. <laughs> schnapps and half of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's uh, great. see, Mark can I've relate, can't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that yellow is a good cover for book covers. Is that true? Because it's eye catching. I I don't know. This is the first one I've yeah. I had that color on. I think that's interesting. I'm sure there is some kind of like uh, psychology behind colors and covers and stuff. I'm sure there is. I mean, sub was it Subway or somebody that like, did their colors of their stuff because it like invokes hunger or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, god damn, y'all are really trying to get us, aren't you? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of, for me, every time I talk to an artist about cover art, it ends with make it gratuitously cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just want to look at it and be like, fuck yeah. Fuck and then, yeah. you know, blow it up in a big poster or a stretch canvas and put it up on my wall. Makes me happy. Absolutely. Uh, Gabriel says Beyond Redemption is covered. Doesn't show the craziness of the book, but it's it's great to be surprised. Uh, as a fact, I know a lot of book and movie companies don't use de- t- those detailed covers. They need a cover that will stick out when people are looking at them on small screens. Hmm. Yeah, I don't claim of, to be yeah. good at the business side of this. Yeah. I just, a lot of I just want to make me happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, Lana had Lauren, Lana runs the India Accords, and uh, so she's experienced with this. But there were a whole bunch of yellow and orange this year in SF SPFBO. Okay. <clears throat> cool. Wasn't last year like a lot of black and whites and reds? Hmm. Reds and yeah, there was a lot of red and a lot of yeah. You're right, red, white, and black. Yep. Is a oh. is a black thorn in this year? Did you put it no, in? Or no, I can't remember. No, I didn't this year. Uh, oh. I might next, but this year it is in SPF or SPSFC. So, oh, uh, that's 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 yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. So. How much do, do those com- those competitions help as an author? And does it help get your book out there? Does it help get it in uh, maybe to people who may not have seen it before? Yeah, for me, I get a pretty good visibility boost, if not sales. I mean, people at least know that I've written the book and it's out there and it, it really kind of depends on where you land in the, in the competition too, to be quite honest. Um, semifinalists do okay. Finalists 
almost always get a sales bump. There's, there's, you know, there's, as far as anybody else, a lot of it's just word of mouth. And if the reviews are at least um, there, I should say, instead of, Hey, we cut these five books and nothing, nothing else. So it, it, it really does depend on placement as well. So, yeah. If you land in the finals, that's, that's very different from not landing in the finals. That's a, it's a good size bump. Um, I got really lucky and I wish I'd done it on purpose, but not that smart. Uh, <laughs> the sequel to Blackstone Heart, uh, which was in the previous years uh, before Norilska, um, SPFBO, uh, the sequel released basically within a week or so of the contest ending. Um, so you had Blackstone Heart came in second as the sequel was dropping. And that was just this like huge spike for sales there. And on the first one, like uh, it's mental. But then when the third book mm. came out, like I, I have not seen that before. Mm-hmm. That wasn't planned at all. <laughs> 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 that would have, that would have required, you know, forethought and stuff rather than the book yeah. is done. I have cover. Art. I'm going to publish it. Oh, fuck. That worked. Cool. I'm, I'm convinced, you know, they, they say, what is it? The, the 99% perspiration one percent luck or whatever and i'm convinced that writing is in the end is probably a good 85 percent luck it's just who finds it where it lands yeah you know i mean so blackstone heart two years ago came in second um there were blogs there that reviewed it that gave it like a four or a five um had it landed in the very first round with them it wouldn't have even made semifinals. like that's luck is a huge thing uh you know it's landing with the right reviewer at the right time the right story you know um it yeah it's luck is yeah. is massive it's the same way when you query though i mean you could catch an agent on a bad day and a book he might normally buy he passes on you know that sort of thing so it's ah, god it's so so fickle yep and really your job is to uh, give luck as many opportunities to land on you as possible. So that's, you're really working your ass off not to be good, um, but to, to have another chance at getting lucky. Yeah. It's kind of a lot like being married. <laughs> it seems almost like the, the writing the book is just the first step because it seems like what comes after is just as important as what as writing the book can be sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say I'd say actually writing the book is just a smidgen of that pie, and then everything else is oh, there's so much work that afterwards. So yeah, and then you're also, I mean, while you're doing all that, you're writing the next book, and you're trying to manage the last book, and it's 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 a never-ending cycle, and it's and some people are very very good at it, just incredible at it, uh, and then there's me who forgets that I wrote a book, and. <laughs> That <laughs> remembers maybe every three months to promote it. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Spectre on the movie outside. Uh, it's why they show them actors' big face taking up the whole cover <laughs> uh, for marketing. Uh, querying sounds like a very soul crushing experience because to query, you send a bunch of queries out. <laughs> that must be tough to to do and to keep keep going yeah it's it's brutal um so back in the day 2009 i guess i started querying agents uh for what was called 88 at the time later became ghost of tomorrow um i like hundreds of rejections um it and i just you know was stubborn because i was like yes i'm going to be famous this is an amazing book It, it wasn't um and I remember like I, I eventually I managed it landed with a, like a small Canadian publisher and a year after it was released. Uh, it was, so sometime it was published in 2013, 2014, I was still receiving rejection letters. Like that's how long it takes some, and this is agents, this isn't publishers. That's how long it takes some, some, you know, some agents to sort of respond just, you know, two years later, it's like, yeah, we don't want your book. Like, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, 
the the waiting part is really hard. Yeah. Um, especially now when when you can self publish it, and especially if you've had a, like a little bit of self publishing success, you know, to 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 submit a book, you're like, I could just put it out and start making money. Or, you know, do I send it off to agents and hope they get back fairly quickly, you know, and maybe make more money? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, and a lot of that is dependent on, you know, because these days, if, if you're savvy enough, I think you can probably survive without ever having to talk to an agent. Um, and I, I, you know, Mike's pretty much proved that because he's got God knows how many successful series at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's what you want out of it. Do you want more visibility? Do you want to be in brick and mortar? Do you want, you know, the, a shot at some awards, that sort of thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's all very subjective. You know, there are people that, that say they'll, they'll never touch traditional publishing and, and vice versa. And it's, it's just, you know, back back to the point though. Uh, yeah, querying can really suck the life out of you. <laughs> it's it's uh, I after after I think after River of Thieves, I had sent out about 120 queries and got a couple bites and really just never went anywhere. Um, and that that kind of broke me for querying for a while. Uh, and now I just I pick maybe five or six agents, send them the stuff. If they don't like it, I publish it. Because I, I just don't have, I don't have a year to two years for me to want people to read this, you know, um, as far as the, not, I shouldn't say I don't have a year or two years. I, I don't have that waiting on somebody else to decide if they want to read it. So. How tough is formatting once you have the, the book written is, is formatting it to self publish it rough. Getting no, the it's, formatting it's rough? super easy. It's easy. It's ridiculously easy. Like I'm an alcoholic chimp and I managed to do all that shit myself. So it is, if I can do it, really anybody can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I usually cheat and just send the manuscript off to a friend who has vellum and then she just formats the whole thing for me and I throw it on the Amazon. So I, it's, it's literally not even a second thought for me other than what kind of booze to buy her. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Sounds like a good, a good so crystal friend. accepting payment in whiskey now. Pretty much. Nice. <laughs> All right. She likes scotch and it's gotta be peaty. Oh, geez. <laughs> nice. Another, uh, uh, Gabriel says I did a lot of research on publishing and book business to know I won't be famous as a young guy. My dreams are already crushed. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. You know, it's, it's weird. I, so I, I didn't start writing until I was 40. 3940. Yeah. So uh you know, I'm not going to be famous, but on the other hand like not doing terribly. You know, like this isn't this isn't awful. So I mean, you know, it depends on what you want. And like like Clayton said, um like I'm I'm going to query this next book I finished because for me part of the dream was always uh a publishing deal and a book in print in brick and mortar stores um you know that is part of how right or wrong i i define success is like can i get that and like i've achieved a different kind of success and that's amazing and i'm really fucking happy about that um but that's still that doesn't change the other part of my dream and so uh like a dumbass i'm still gonna chase that yeah and I'm I'm the same way. I mean, I've I've wanted to publish since I was, oh God, twelve or thirteen, and that's that's always been the thing I've wanted to do is is see my book sitting in Barnes and Noble or, or and this doesn't exist anymore, but like Walden Books or you know <laughs> any one of those stores and be able to walk into them and, and say, oh, I, I wrote that, and, and then stand next to it and creep people out by going, I wrote that every time they walk by. <laughs> so. Dude, one of the stupid. F- most fun things I did, and this is how much of a nerd I am, when Beyond Redemption first came out and was in stores, I hit local bookstores and just walked in and was like signing books and leaving notes to people because I'm like, I live right here. Like, ah, that was fun. 
Awesome. And then a couple of them showed up, like people would post them on uh, Facebook or whatever later. It's like, oh, cool, you got that one. <laughs> That's cool. pretty. That'd be cool. Yeah, Joanna's here. Uh, hey, Joanna. Hope you're having hey, a good Friday. Uh, Nick said, no. off to, uh, "Have a good night, guys. Off to work for me." All right. See you, Nick. <laughs> Did have a, oh, and a lot of said buy uh, buy her writer's tears. <laughs> is <laughs> that's that a any good? One in my house too. <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Is it good? Okay. Yeah, that I'll take Jameson over it, but it's not bad. Hmm. Uh, had a quick question. Uh, how's SF? I always get this wrong. SPFBO judging going for you, Michael? Was this a uh, TY from the <laughs> SFBC team for Rosco? <laughs> they they threatened me. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this year not having a book in and uh, having been in the previous two years, I, I thought it was, you know, I kind of wanted to um to give something back um, by really shattering the dreams of some younger writers and absolutely pillaging their every hope. Uh, and so it's been great for that. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's actually it's been. I like the community side of this is probably my favorite part. Uh, the FBC team that's a fantasy book critic. Um, there's a great bunch of people and uh, t talking about books. Um, and it, it's forced me to read stuff I otherwise wouldn't have and have found some that I really didn't like. And, but also like uh, a couple where I'm like, this is cool. I like this. What were some books that, if you can tell us, some books that stood out to you that surprised you? Um, I, this is uh, so it didn't make the semifinals because I'm a picky fucker. Um, Patrick Leclerc, Leclerc's um, uh, "Beckoning the Void" um, was, in my personal batch, uh, one of the better. Actually, it was the best book in the batch that I got. Uh, he did banter really well. Um, uh, he really nailed this sort of like dry sense of humor. Uh, and it was, it was a very cool story. Um, for me, it just didn't make it because there were what felt like a lot of point of view issues. Uh, you know, it kind of skipped around from like a very loose third to omniscient to a tight third and sometimes you're right in somebody's head and sometimes it would just sort of tell you stuff that you wouldn't kind of otherwise know and you know and it would bounce heads a bit too much for me um but the actual story itself and how it was written the prose level was really good so i i think um i like i wouldn't be surprised if he nails some of that stuff and this is just, this is all totally taste right this does not mean it's I'm correct or anything, but for me, um, if he nails that, uh, his next book will be really fucking good. Hmm. Hmm. But that's just me. Like I said, you can be like, fuck you. You're wrong. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever thought about judging one of those competitions, Clayton or and Mark? Have you, have you guys ever thought about it? Oh, I, <clears throat> You know, I, I, I considered it briefly, but my uh, I, I'm probably just as picky as Mike, if not pickier. I, I drop books left and right, so I, I probably wouldn't make a great judge. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, it sounds weird probably coming from me because I'm a book reviewer, but uh, it's like the the concept of reading all those goddamn books, like all like, I feel like I would just fall behind as well as. I feel like there'd be I'd I'd probably be making a lot of goddamn cuts. <laughs> like, just, like, like yeah, well, and that's, not, it's like game, I don't, and it might be just because of whatever you know, it is what it is. I might not be the best like uh S whatever it is, S P F B blah 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 O fucking uh <laughs> you know, candidate for a judge, you know. I definitely have my own style of doing book reviews and stuff that seems to work and people like it. Uh I don't know if I'm a real good judge. You know what I mean? I mean, some because sometimes I'll be the first one to admit it too. Is like I I'll give certain things a pass or this or that. You know what I mean? It's it, it's not be, like I give this like bad thing a pass because I like this or whatever. You know, and I don't know if that's really the the greatest way to judge a, a competition. Um, I don't know. 
Well, it's all, it's also subjective too, you know. It's it's man, it's it's just <laughs> it all kind of balances on that the feather versus stone thing, and it's just yeah, it's very difficult to say. Hey, this is this is excellent writing versus this is terrible writing when you don't have a point of reference sometimes. So I'm also a, an extreme mood reader. Right. Like that's why I don't do TBRs. Like I have an idea what I want to read in the near future, but I also have like 20 of those books. You know, I have 20 books selected for the near future. So I can just kind of as my mood shifts, like I select the one that fits it the best, you know. So like reading a bunch of books just to read them and judge them is not exactly my cup of tea. And I also kind of worry that it would do something nasty, like throw me in a reading slump. Because I'm like, dude, I just had to fucking do all this goddamn reading. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It wasn't even fun. It made you work out of it. It's become a job. <laughs> you ruined my yeah. hobby. Yeah, yeah, you motherfuckers. <laughs> Which is hilarious. I mean, that's what that's how writing starts for most of us, right? Yeah. I mean, I remember like music for, was a hobby for me. And then I wound up in the music industry for 20 years and hated it by the end. And then, and I, when I was hating music, uh, I started writing as a hobby. Now that's my job. And I'm like, no, don't do that again. No, don't (laughs) fuck it up, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Uh, Gabriel Gabriel says, and hearing people narrate, narrating your books, the sheer pride. Is that weird to have someone narrate your books? Eh, yeah, that meh. Yeah, yeah. Nah, not so much. It, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be as weird as like me narrating my own books. <laughs> that, that, that's me personally. I mean, I know Mike does it, and yeah, I, I just, I can't, I can't listen to my own voice. I'll, I'll never watch this again. Just <laughs> oh, <listen. yeah. laughs> the, the weirdest part is, is uh, fan mail. Yeah. We're like I've sent writers fan mail, but they're like actual real writers. I'm I'm pretty sure you're all real writers. And you know, Wait. when 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 I get some, I'm kinda like it's, I'm just like, dude, we, we just hang out and chat and shit like well, hold on, you get fan very... mail. <laughs> <laughs> I get some weird stuff. <laughs> huh. Uh, Drew said, happy Friday, everyone. Can't stay, but wanted to stop by and say hi. I feel bad. I can never watch these live, but I'll for sure catch the replay. Hope everyone is, has a good weekend. So we shall. Uh, speaking of whiskey, what is what are your daily sippers? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I like Jameson. Um, there's a couple scotches in there that I that I really like. Uh, Belvini. I have a Belvini 12 that's really good. Um uh, Glen Fitted, um 15, I think it is, is pretty decent. But really, the, the Jameson and the Belvini are my two favorites. So, Do you have a celebratory whiskey that you drink when you have a, a book drop? Like Blackthorn, mm. do you, do you, what's, what's your celebratory drink? Yeah, probably the Belvini. It's, uh, you know, it's a scotch, but you can, it, it's so smooth, it's ridiculous. There's, there's almost no peat flavor to it, and it's... It's um, double cask aged, so it's like sherry and whiskey they, they aged in. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's probably my, you know, and the bottle cost me a small arm and a leg, so I, I tend to, <laughs> that one only tends to get broken out for the most part when, when something good happens. So, Michael, what about you at your, at your daily and what's your special uh, occasion? Yeah, I mean, I'm ah, just trash. Just give me, just give me Jameson. That's all I want, Jameson. Uh, there's always some in the house. Uh, if I have a book release, um, I'll get the good Jameson. I'll get like the Black Barrel uh, every now and then. You know, when I'm feeling all like, ooh, I'll, oh, I'll get the uh, the Stout Edition Jameson. <laughs> but I really, I just, I just want the regular Jameson, and um, you know, give it to me by the bucket. <laughs> So special occasion, Jameson, daily separate Jameson. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. What about you, Mark? Do you are you a whiskey drinker? Uh, I used to be. I actually do not drink anything anymore. Uh, but it's not because I don't like drinking. It's because I like drinking too much. 
<laughs> I had one of those fucking issues. Uh, and after years and years and years of fucking fighting it, I finally just gave up and stopped. You know, and, it, and it's done me all, all the world of fucking favors. Uh, I just, it sucks. It sucks that, you, you know, like you don't want to be the guy that doesn't know how to party responsibly, but I am the guy who doesn't know how to fucking party responsibly, you know? <laughs> so I, I do have like a non-alcoholic beer and stuff. And I on to tell you the truth, the trashier of the non-alcoholic beer, <laughs> it just it just pleases me all day. I found this old Milwaukee non-alcoholic beer, and I was like, dude, this is so fucking good. <laughs> but when I uh yeah, when I did drink though, it was trash city all the way. It was like Jameson was fancy. I remember this one stuff. My bro- my roommate and I, when I when I was living in Santa Cruz, California, uh, we we would buy this stuff because there was a liquor store just down the road. It was called Fighting Cock Whiskey, and you could get, <laughs> and it had like a picture of a pissed off rooster on the front, and it was like five dollars for a fist. <laughs> <laughs> Just, like that in, in Canadian Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Shit like that, dude. Oh, I'm surprised I'm alive, to tell you the truth. Uh, there's sh- <laughs> the, the amount of horrible shit I put in my body could have killed plenty of people. They say only the good die young, though, I guess. So, right? <laughs> I'll be here forever. <laughs> I'll have to get some more NA recommendations from you. My father-in-law is big into O'Doul's and... Uh, it's about all he drinks. So yeah, honestly, O'Doul's is maybe the one. O'Doul's is like one of the ones that is probably on my least like favorite. The one I hate the most is I like Budweiser came out with one, oh. and I drank I drank it the other day, and I was like, this straight up tastes like how cat piss smells. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was like. I, I ain't doing this. I ain't fucking doing this, dude. Oh, yeah, I, ended Steve. Up doing, I ended up doing it, but <laughs> there goes your Budweiser sponsorship. Yep. Yeah, I know. Fuck me. Whatever. Yeah. Old Milwaukee. Yeah. I'm holding out for old Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was a lot of fun, I would have to say, <clears throat> until I wasn't, you know, and that was the issue with me drinking, you know. I'd be a barrel of laughs and then I'd be a fucking nightmare. And my kids just deserve something better. And honestly, so do I. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just, it's too much, man. I, I've definitely lived enough, uh, a destructive lifestyle, enough to kill, like, people, for sure. Like, I, and that's not even a joke. It's not a boast, either. It's kind of sad. But it is what it is. And I don't have a time machine to go back and change things. So I just try to do the best I can today. And that only seems to happen if I stay sober. It sucks, because I like partying. <laughs> <laughs> But it also gives me a perspective, you know what I mean? I have to admit, like, sobering up did a lot of, like, uh, gave me a lot of, it changed things. And now I see things through different glasses, you know, kind of deal. You know, I had to work on a lot of behaviors, stuff like that. But uh, um, as far as, you know, from a storytelling aspect, I feel like I have somewhat of, maybe not a unique, but a specific um, pers- uh, perspective that could be told. I, I'd really like to dive into some of that, like like, substance abuse kind of shit in fantasy. Um, it's, it's something that's really intriguing to me just because of my own per- personal experiences. And uh, it's one of those things, man. It's like as much as I think that stuff like alcohol should be celebrated, that we also have to be real and understand how destructive it can be as well. Yeah. Not to ruin the fucking mood, guys. No. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus so, came Steve. in here. Now I don't even want to yeah. fucking drink. Now I'm crying in my whiskey. This fucking bastard. <laughs> Every time you take a drink, just be like, oh, Mark said I was a horrible person. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not. That's the thing. It's a it's a tough pill to swallow when you realize it's not the world's fault. You know what I mean? This is it's it's not my it's not their issue that I don't know how to handle my shit. You know what I mean? Um, it's so it's a weird thing you got to personally grasp with. The world can't stop turning just because you got an issue. You know, you got to learn how to deal with your shit. No, good for you that you that you're able to make those changes in your life. Yeah, I try. You know what I mean? It's all, it's a trying thing. You know what I mean? I've in the past I had my stumbles and I got back up on it and everything and, and got back, you know put put my head in one direction and started heading there. It's it's a tough deal, man. Like I was saying, there's so much to it that a lot of times gets kind of glossed over or you don't think about. 
Uh, but like the struggle of a regular, like a real alcoholic is in fucking tense, dude. It's intense and it's ridiculous in so many ways. Uh, but it's something I think a lot of human beings could understand if they, if they kind of like get it from a, like a, an, a, a realistic perspective, I guess I, that's what I'm trying to shoot for there. Uh, Gabriel says, Steve, what's your yeah. favorite whiskey? <laughs> um, yeah, no shit. What about you, Steve? <laughs> I've been. Uh, I've, I'm a fan of Old Granddad for my daily supper. It's uh, it's cheap and usually available, so it's it's not bad for like a like a daily uh, special occasion. Probably what's that whiskey with a stag on it? I forget. I always forget the name of it. I'll have to look it up. It has a stag horns on it. Um, I'll think of it as soon as we end the stream. I'm sure. Uh, I keep so thinking there. of Jägermeister. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> has a stag on the bottle. Yeah, let me see. I'll find it here. Um, I know I'll, I'll, I'm going to kick myself and remember what it was. Uh, Gabriel says, I only have beers. My budget is low for whiskey, sadly. Uh, but when I release my book, I'll have one. Writer's Tears. Uh, this chat is gold. <laughs> I said my husband's <laughs> beers. Uh, Chris says, that's where a booktube sometimes makes you want to spend a fortune on whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Very good influence. Yeah. That's it. So I keep, I keep trying to, I keep uh, hitting up uh, Jameson on Twitter, su suggesting they start sponsoring writers. And so far, they've completely ignored me. Yeah. <laughs> it seems unreasonable. I mean, whiskey and writers kind of goes hand Maybe in hand. Maybe we need to right? shoot lower, like Canadian Mist or something. Yeah, that's the Shit thing. Lord. Go for fighting cock. Hit up fighting cock. <laughs> they got you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I wonder if they're still in business. <laughs> With the name like that, they have to be. They have yeah, to be I, that's it. I think that they were like they were clever enough to be like, look, our product sucks, but our name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, the whiskey I found, it's uh, Dalmore. The Dalmore. Dalmore. I always forget the name. Uh, I was always the sober one in the club, having the best time with my younger uh, party, in my younger party years, but that was because I was so poor. I learned to be the life of the party without drinking. Yeah. Yeah, drinking and, or really any kind of like, you know, recreational activity there with drugs or alcohol it can be very expensive. Yeah, that's up. Uh, but I also used to be able to drink, <laughs> drink my big Samoan brothers under the table. My dad taught me how to drink. <laughs> uh, Gira says my protagonist is fighting off alcohol addiction. Mark will like that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Fittich. No, it's close. Yeah, the Dom I always forget the Dalmore. I always forget the name of it. I always remember the bottle. Forget the name. Uh, Chris says I agree, Lana. Have fun with or without the assistance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, glad it was only a rooster on the bottle. Yeah. <laughs> in my head, I had a picture of just uh, <laughs> Irish boxing gloves. Like. <laughs> oh man! Now uh, that's Jonathan's a tattoo. Here. Yeah, that's a great tattoo. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go searching for that whiskey now, just to have a bottle of it, just for the laughs, just just to just to have one oh, handy. Fuck, that'll be the special occasion drink. And uh, Clayton, you're a, a whisk, uh, cigar smoker too, right? Yep. Yeah. What do you? What's your celebratory smoke? Oh, uh, usually something somewhat mellow for the most part. I think I recently. Well, I shouldn't say that. So it's it's usually a toss up between either uh, Romeo and. Uh, Romeo y Julieta, or um, uh, my father, the judge. Nice. So, yeah, I like I like them both. So, just depends on what's in my humidor at the time. Nice. You partake, Mike? Cigars? Uh, very, very occasionally. Pretty much, uh, if I if I visit my dad, I will take up a, a bunch of beers. I'll hit the local cigar shop. That really is the only time I smoke uh, like anything at all. And so that's like once every once or twice a year, maybe. And usually Dominicans of some kind. I don't know enough about cigars. I just kind of go in and I'm like, I have this much money. What can I have? 
<laughs> Mark, you uh, you ever <laughs> when you catch your breath, you, you remind me of when I was a little kid buying fucking candy. Yep. <laughs> You throw your Bazooka Joe and Jolly Ranchers on the fucking counter and you just put slide the change. You're like, I have that much. <laughs> <laughs> and you just stare them in the eyes like, is this going to work? You're like, am I good? <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I used to smoke cigarettes forever. Uh, so I don't really smoke anything like <clears throat> cigars or nothing like that no more because uh, I just don't. I vape like crazy though. I smoked cigarettes for like fucking almost two decades. So uh, I I started vaping just to quit smoking, mm -hmm. and I found out through vaping that I just still am not willing to give up nicotine because mm -hmm. I'm like I've necked down a lot like on my milligrams of nicotine, uh, but I have no want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like I fucking I'm perfectly happy with this. Sucking on this thing like a fucking robot dick all goddamn day. <laughs> what are you done in your milligrams? What what do you usually have in your? Uh, right, I worked all the way down to three, and then I actually worked it back up to six because I know, did notice that uh, at three it was like it never left my fucking mouth. I was just like, you know. So six made it where I could at least step away from it for a little bit. Uh, it's. It's crazy. I will say this about like vaping. I feel way better. You know, I've been doing it for years now. So I'm like, I have like when I smoked, I sounded like a bong. You know what I mean? I was just like gurgle, gurgle, gurgle every fucking time I fucking breathe. You know. <laughs> so all that went away, you know, and I can actually like I, I go on mile walks all the time and stuff, you know. So uh, physically, I'm feeling such better shape. Uh, but addict, like the addiction wise, I have to say, like, I feel like I'm more addicted a little bit to my vape, just as far as like how often I'm like fucking needing to go to the little binky there, you know, got to like the rat at the fucking feeder, you know, just got to get a little. Where with cigarettes, it was like you'd actually you'd smoke one and step away for a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Some Well, sometimes unless you're drinking, then it's just. You're like, where did my carton go? Oh, I smoked it all in one night. Perfect. Cool. Let's go get another one. <laughs> God damn, these things are great, aren't they, boys? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me, dude. <laughs> uh, oh, man. I actually smoked one cigarette not too long, like about three years ago. I, uh, I, like I smoked a, a cigarette and it was the worst goddamn tasting thing I put in my mouth, man. I was just ugh, ugh, like, no good. Which is weird because I vape tobacco flavored stuff, but that goes to show you like how the difference, I guess. There's a huge yeah. difference still. Yeah, for sure. But one time yeah. I did smoke a Cuban cigar in a strip club and I felt pretty fucking cool. <laughs> It was my buddy's bachelor bachelor party, and my dad had like come back from Russia or something like that, uh, and he had like a box of Cuban cigars, and I I like he gave me two of them for this bachelor party, and I just I thought we were the coolest dudes in stripper town, you know. <laughs> it was a fun night. Uh, Lana says Mark has the best main character energy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am part cartoon character. I did an ancestry.com <laughs> and my results have come back. Roger Rabbit is a direct descendant. Of <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a lot of energy. That's why I think a lot of people dig my book reviews. You know what I mean? I think sometimes that's what's needed, though, in certain some places like books. Books can get uh, kind of a shitty rep for being boring or work or something like that. A lot of people don't understand the level of fucking cool and just, you know, excitement that awaits them inside those pages. And sometimes it takes, you know, a, a fucking knucklehead like me, you know, like getting all excited for them to really like let it soak in and go, holy shit, like this dude's like vibing about books. Like, all right, maybe I'll fucking give it a shot. You know, if that, that if that's what it takes, fucking that's what it takes. The cool thing is, is I'm legitimately excited about the books, so I don't have to like 
put on a show. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I do get worked up and I'm, I get excited easy, you know? Uh, Josh says, Mark, please integrate these stories in your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm sure there. Well, yeah, there's, I've got some ideas cooking. I got to finish what I fucking started. I have to. I like that clip that, that Jed put out there of you, Mike, because it, it really actually, it's one of those things like you wonder if the universe is talking to you because when I saw that clip, it just so happened to be like, like the clip I needed to see, you know, it was one of those yeah. things where you're like, fuck man, I'm, really kind of going back and forth and what the fuck i should do should i bail should i redo it should I start something else you know and then you get something like that just kind of delivered and you're like you know what this i'm just gonna take this as a fucking message you know what i mean and, and i'm gonna it was, finish, finish it what was i started a life changer for me in terms yeah. of in terms of writing uh and the clip he's talking about i can sum it up super fast um uh, when you finish your first novel uh, you have killed the fear that you can't finish a novel mm-hmm. like it. Now, you know, you can write a book. All the books after that. You, you it's not that they're easy, but you no longer have to deal with that. And it's that is a surprisingly it's a big deal. Good book, too. It, it's still going to be like fucking ripping your own arm off and beating yourself to dead with to death with the with the soggy end. But, you know, at the end, you're going to finish it. Because you're like, yeah, I'm a dude who can write a book. Um, and yeah, I, after Jed, uh, you know, posted that little clip, I've had a pile of people reaching out mm-hmm. saying that that was sort of what they needed to hear. Yeah. And that was uh, that was my first book was like something in me cracked. And I was just like, because I tried so many times to write books. And I was like, fuck everything. I am going to finish this book. And so... When we were on our honeymoon, I was writing a fucking book. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> what book were you writing on your honeymoon? Uh, that was 88, which later became Ghosts of Tomorrow. Nice. That was that was the first thing I ever wrote. Like, <clears throat> finished. Nice. Yeah, that's a really excellent point, though. It took me the better part of three years to write my first book. And it was 60,000 words. It's 20,000 words a year. <laughs> and, uh, but I finished it. And when I finished it, I knew I could do the next one and the next one and the next one. And the problem I had then was the same problem Mark has right now, which is, which fucking one do I pick? Because I had so many damn ideas coming at me. But I knew I could do it. So. You could do it, Mark. Man, I am guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i'm glad i like it's, it's, for me be, maybe i'm just a moody person period i am a moody reader maybe i'm a moody writer as well you know um and my, i might need to break out of that a little bit and just buckle down and, and be a little bit more of a, a workhorse as well i'm just i get so moody with my creativity man but I am really think I like I literally just did like a live deal chat and I was talking about how I was going to scrap everything and rewrite it. And the one guy that's actually read like what I wrote was like, dude, I thought it was impressive. And this is a dude that doesn't bullshit. Uh, and he's like, I've seen him like fucking be mean. And like, and I told him, I was like, you follow me, you don't have to lie to me. And he's like, no, he's like, these are the problems. But like the for this shit is fucking good. He's like, because he read that same thing that I sent you. Uh, Mike and you know he told me he was like yeah it's not that good you know (laughs) 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 but yeah so I I think what I'm gonna do is that like getting hit with that clip and all that stuff I'm just buckling down like I said I've I've gone through I'm just about finished rereading like everything I wrote and I'm gonna start writing I'll probably be writing either tonight or tomorrow and I'm just gonna get this thing finished the cool thing is I know a lot of these narrative beats I just gotta fill in the fucking you know the right i just gotta write it you yeah. know and you're you're in with the community like the the next step once you finished your sort of first draft uh you've got is going to be so much easier for you than someone who's not part of the community at all like right you, yeah you i will have no trouble with connected. readers yeah. and all that shit yeah it's and that that kind of help is huge yeah for sure. For sure. Yeah. I'm very fortunate to be like, uh, starting where like in being in the position that I'm already in. 
Uh, just just with knowing other reviewers, not to say that they're going to read my shit, but there's a chance. I already have a chance that I, I have several people I could hand my book off to and get a review on YouTube, you know, stuff like that, uh, which is good because, yeah, not everybody has that, you know. Uh, I'm in a whole big thing like where I, you know, I run a channel. So I'm like, I'm in this kind of personal uh, conflict of like, do I just keep doing my channel, run it as is? or Do I not plug my own shit, you know? Uh, and just let see if it like how it floats on its own merit kind of deal or do I plug my shit on my because it's only like trying to help it succeed even better get more eyes on it it's I don't yeah. know I don't know it's a weird thing you know sometimes you you, you know you guys self, fucking know this self is promotion good. feels so weird and this is like yeah. years later I'm still like people are like oh tell me about your book and like mm, yeah how about, right how about I don't <laughs> I'm like, how about you read it and then you tell me about it? <laughs> it's way better. Like, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it. Let me hear says, uh, Mark, you need to narrate your books whenever you finish them. Oh man, I don't know. Uh, I I'm like uh, I'm like right with Clayton on this one, man. I I feel like I have the voice of an asshole. You know, like I just <laughs> like who the fuck is gonna pay money to torture themselves? <laughs> <laughs> with however many you know hours of fucking me talking it'd be hilarious though too it'd be funny if i couldn't stick to my own script and i just cursed through the whole thing like i normally do on these kinds of things <laughs> and this fucking guy said <laughs> ah shit yeah i don't know I do, I will say this, when I'm writing, when I go back and read it, I try to think about it being narrated, though. I don't know. Do you guys do that at all when you're writing? Do you feel like, don't even pay attention to that? Nope. See, I'm so caught up in the way that the fucking thing flows. <laughs> that know? matters. I, I do think about flow. Um, and I, you know, will read it sort of to myself, but I'm not thinking about a narrator uh, because it's also how, how it looks on the page, right? Like your white space versus your text. And if you've got like a huge dense block of text, you, you know, you start thinking like, do I need to break that up a little bit? Right. You know, I like a, a, a decent amount of white space. I like to, I like fast dialogue, you know, quick back and forth between people. Um, so like how it flows is hugely important. How, how it sounds totally matters. Um, but I'm still thinking about it in terms of a reader rather than yeah, a narrator. Yeah, yeah. Not, not a narrator. Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's always there's there's three things I always think about flow, like Mike, like Mike had mentioned, which is, you know, just how it looks on the page, how it reads to you, uh, short paragraph, long paragraph, short sentence, long sentence, that sort of alternation of, of, of language. And then um, dialogue. Do people actually talk like this? Yes. Because I find a lot of books where people don't. I mean, the, 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 the language is fine, but if you were to run into somebody like that, you would walk the other way because they're not normal yeah um, and then third is is how it looks in my head is this you know i i see a lot of stuff as, as cinematic or or as um scenes as as uh sketches and that sort of thing in my head so that's how i typically try to lay them out when i'm writing them right so. i guess if I had to try to explain it, that I mean, because I've spent so much of my life watching film, and I definitely understand. And that's funny that I ended up starting a book review channel because I should have been reviewing movies, if I'm being honest. Like with the amount of experience I had in film versus books, but when I write, I notice that's where I'm at now. Is I take it like I approach it kind of like a director, where I'm like, okay, this is a close-up shot. This one's panned out. This one's fucking here. Like it just seemed it seemed to help me kind of be able to get things going because I, I was having a hard time. I'm like, I know what I'm like. I know the scene, but I'm having a hard time like fucking actually putting it on the paper. You know what I mean? Or I would write it and I'm like, this is so fucking stiff and it doesn't like it feels wrong. So then I just kind of thought about it like like shooting a movie, you know, and it was like, what would this look like on the screen? You know, it was like, OK, this and I do, it does do this thing though I noticed is it, it, ra it gets me where I'm kind of bombarding people with imagery though and I I need to kind of pinch that back I think and then also incorporate other senses besides sound and fucking sight like the sense of touch and the sense of smell I'm so horrible at, at like a, incorporating them um, so I'm, that's something I'm struggling with currently and even even taste is another one but um, 
Yeah, I've noticed like even even with dialogue, a lot of times you'll just get a lot of back and forth, and you won't have characters actually doing things. Uh, you know, if we're not just sitting in our rooms and talking to each other, typically when you're ta- having a conversation with someone, someone is is doing something else, or you're doing something else, and you're you're still following the conversation, and it's it just feels more natural, you know. Right. Absolutely. That's the what I noticed that I cannot help but write those little like uh, body movements in between my di- like my dialogue. If someone's saying something, they'll say like part of their sentence and then I've written so like, oh, and they, you know, shift or whatever and then finish the rest of their sentence or whatever. Mm-hmm. Because people are never standing still. At least I'm not. <laughs> 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 So it just it's, it would be very stiff, right? You know, you're just like, what are these guys literally just standing, fucking staring at each other, the, intently in the eyes, saying these, these fucking things? Like, come on, man! They're moving around bit by bit. Everything they say to each other is going to invoke, you know, an emotion, a reaction, something, even at the slightest bit. You know, it's like, did their fucking did their eye twitch at that when they said, you know, whatever? Are they raising an eyebrow, snapping their fingers, whatever? You know, I talk with my hands all the fucking time. You know, so I imagine like that stuff needs to kind of be in there for it to feel a little bit more organic and not so rigid. But dialogue is funny, man. Like you get into some dialogue where you're like, I think it's hilarious when you're like, dude, this is not at all how people fucking talk. (laughs) I noticed with my own, I get I got really a lot better at like the beginning of my dad like when the characters first start talking to each other it's like they've never talked to anybody ever in their entire lives <laughs> but then like but then all of a sudden like four or five sentences in it's like they've done nothing but talk their entire lives yeah. like i gotta smooth this little first bit out <laughs> i always think of uh it's very awkward at first when i'm when i think of dialogue i always think of nicholas eames yeah uh, he had <clears throat> he had mentioned something once uh which was uh, show me someone who doesn't speak in contractions and I will shoot first and inspect their shiny metal insides later. So. Uh, Lana says, I would pay money to listen to it. I do it for free now on your channel anyway. I actually like your voice. Your voice and accent <laughs> is unique in my part of the world. Oh, yeah. Well, I live in Alaska. We talk with our nose a lot, so. We're very nasally. Nasally. Lana <laughs> uh, asks, do you guys use text to voice programs to uh, for your manuscripts to hear it? I haven't. I haven't done anything like that. I mean, I've just I just get on Microsoft Word or Office or whatever it is and I just start typing. Yeah. Oh, for but going the other way, text to voice. So my last editing pass is I have Word uh, read my book to me as I'm reading along. Uh, that's it's great for catching like little errors, little typos, hmm. you know, the the little my eye I gloss past words because I know what it's supposed to be, and so my brain is like, yeah, 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 yeah I was fine, just keep going. But when when I hear the computer reading it to me, you know, it, it's jarring when I've got the wrong word or you know misspelled a letter, like an if instead of an in kind of thing, and you know, listening to it, you're like, whoa, what the fuck was that? Yeah. So, so that I, I do use that as as an editing tool. Nice, but but not narrating to the computer. I could never do that. Yeah, yeah. I notice there's sometimes like when I'll be using like writing something, it'll like fucking try to show me it's wrong and like what to use, and I'll be like okay and switch it to it, and oh. I'm like typing again, and the thing fucking highlights again. And it says, this is wrong. And it shows me what to do with it. And it reverts it back to the way I fucking had it. And then I go back to typing. It highlights again. It, it keeps doing it. It's like stuck in this thing. It's like, what do you want, motherfucker? You want a comma or a semicolon? Just fucking pick one and stop bugging me. <laughs> yeah, I, I ignore all that shit until it's editing time. Until the book yeah. is done, I... There's little squiggly red lines and blue lines all over my fucking Everywhere, manuscript. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, whatever. Don't I care. probably would have done that. I, I kind of was doing that until I realized that I had no fucking clue what I like how to spell or, or at least like how to use it. I kept like putting a fucking <laughs> fucking glossary in, like to, to make it like plural or like or to make it possessive. But I realized that's not ex- at all what I was actually doing. So I had to go back through my entire story and change every it's. 
<laughs> and at that point, I went, okay, I'll fucking listen to you, word. <laughs> if you correct me, I'll just go along with it. It's not good. Uh, Gibbs says, I mean, in uh, real life dialogues can be very boring. You don't want to sound, uh, you don't want to write something too Shakespearean. Shakespearean. Yeah, and I think maybe that might be an issue that I can kind of create for myself as well. I notice sometimes my characters might sound a little fucking like pompous or just a little too like you sound like you just got out of college. Like, chill, buddy. We all get it. You paid for an education. Like, <laughs> 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 Like, uh, where, yeah, where are you? Where are you? Yeah. Why are you sounding so smart in such a fucking trashy world? <laughs> but I don't know what it is. There's something in me that wants to write write them like that kind of deal. I actually have a character who speaks like that, even though he's kind of trash. He is trash, but like he does it kind of because it, it's more like a facade thing. It makes him feel like he's a in a better uh, standing than he really is, just by like kind of acting that he's a fucking, you know, a, a a gentleman a distinguished person which he's not at all but fucking it feels like if he talks that way then fucking he's more superior than the the miscreants that don't know how to fucking string a sentence together properly uh me here had a good point plug it mark daniel green does it plug it mark daniel green does it yeah it's your platform yeah. i mean you've built it I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've you've worked hard on i yeah i did i did but i mean it was really out of fun you know what i mean it was not to be I don't know it was it wasn't for like a huge personal gain it was like for me to i think at first i wanted to get big and then after a while i realized that what that was going to uh look like and i i kind of fucking went in a total different direction and just started doing everything i wanted to do and nothing that uh the everybody else was doing kind of deal yeah well i think people that watch you want to support you it would be would want to know about what you're working on yeah, like I said, once I get there, it's a, it's one of those things I'm going to have to decide. Am I going to kind of like promote my own shit or am I going to just kind of let it go and see where it, what happens? The one thing is I seriously doubt it'll be the last book I write. If I finish it, I doubt it's going to be the last one. I ser I have one story that's I've literally been thinking of for years, for years. The only reason why I don't write it is because I want to write something first before I go to that one. Um just because I kind of want to know what I'm doing when I finally get it. It's one that's haunted me for so long. I want to uh, come at it like more accomplished or at least like competent and knowing what the fuck I'm doing. Because right now I still kind of don't, you know, the first story I wrote or tried to write, I wrote, I purposely did everything in my weaknesses. I tried to write it in, in present tense. There's no fucking way I can write a story in present tense. <laughs> I wrote it, you know, like uh, from like kind of like a third person, because I guarantee you once I write something from first person, it's probably going to be a lot better than anything I write in third person. Uh, that's just because of the style of how I, I know I like to tell a story. So I know if, if I told it through first person, I'd probably be a lot more successful. And but anyway, I tried to do everything opposite of what would be good because I felt like it would help me become better if I tried to do everything harder. <laughs> 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 ah what a dumb fucking idea dude <laughs> anyway that story crashed and burned and so <laughs> i realized maybe i should not make it a complete fucking hurdle that i cannot jump over you know maybe put something in my favor so i'm still doing third person because i i like the challenge um, and I think that's one of the things that's been kind of shiny for writing. And that's why I knew I was into something because I was like, dude, this is almost like work, but I'm dealing, I'm like loving it. Like I'm liking the challenge. Norm, this is frustrating as fuck, but I like how it's forcing me to like come up with a solution. Like, oh, I'm faced with this. Like I got this scene. There's, this is the, I got, there's an issue. I got to figure this out to make this work. Like getting that process sometimes is some of the funnest shit ever, man. And you really get just you'll never immerse yourself more in a fantasy world, you know? So it's like, as a read, like someone who loves reading fantasy, it can be one of the funnest times you'll ever have as a fantasy reader while you're actually writing it too. Hmm. I don't know. I've had a blast with some, some of the stuff I've done. I've also like hated a lot of shit I've done. Uh, but I've literally wrote something that like, when I read it back, I was laughing fucking out loud, like tear coming out of my fucking <laughs> eye. And I was just like, this is the shit. Like, and I could only imagine you guys have had those same moments because your books have made me, you know, fucking laugh cry. You know, I could specifically call out fucking parts on both your guys' books. That would be spoilers. But yeah, I mean, 
it's a lot of goddamn fun, man. I, I, and I mean, for you guys, I, I gotta, it's gotta be similar, right? Like you're probably, is there any other world you're attached to more than your own? No, I mean, it's the whole yeah. creativity, the entire writing process. Um, I, I like, I'm a junkie for it. It, it yeah. just, it twigs the pleasure centers in my brain. Uh, you know, nothing else makes me feel like that when it's going well. There are the other times when you're just smashing your head against your desk and, you know, you're kind of like, <laughs> ah, why? <laughs> <laughs> but when it's working, it's glorious. Yeah. Uh, Lana says, I love trashy characters that have characteristics that don't fit the stereotype. And, uh, Mark speaking <laughs> facts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's just the thing. Like, uh, like I look at it like this. Like, I remember you saying that you like to DM in, in Dungeons & Dragons, Mike. Yep. Like, you like to do the DM. And that was something as, like, that, like Dungeons & Dragons and tabletop role-playing was, like, one of the massive, like, entry points for me into fantasy. So I, like, hold that kind of stuff really, you know, near and dear. But I've always played the game. You know, I was always a player. And it never, I never could understand. I always felt sorry for the DM. Because I'm like, that uh, poor bastard never even gets to play the game. No, you know I, mean? I was... Like, I just, it must control suck. freak but that's the I, thing. I wanted to make the story i like i could never do those prefab adventure bullshit things yeah 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 i, want, I would do i build my world from scratch i'd make these huge sort of intricate long like year-long campaigns where it was like you know building towards something with like plot arcs and like it was mental you know i good because it just it's like writing it's like uh you know building your own world and, and that's what know, like writing kind of fucking showed me because yeah. I could not wrap my head around you DMs in the Dungeons and Dragons, dude. It just was like I couldn't understand how it could be fun. And then I started writing and I started fucking really getting into the world I was creating and the characters that I was fucking putting on the page. In a, in a way, it just it was nuts. And it was like, dude, this is and it made sense. I was like, this is what those guys. This is why they do it. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because you. you there's so many times, even as a reader, you'll hear, hear an author be like, oh, well, you know, I just did it because it was like it was fun. It was what I wanted to do. And a lot of us can't really wrap our heads around it because we don't write. So it doesn't sound like fun. Reading the story sounds great. But doing the work, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd be amazed. I really was. I was blown away. And that's why I think regardless of what I do with the things I write, I probably never stop writing. It's just too much fun. Time always flies on these. <laughs> they realize it's already about two hours in. But, ah, yeah, no, yeah. it does. I did want a live deal the other day, and I couldn't believe how long it went. It's crazy. Yeah, it just you lose track of time. Uh, Clayton, where's the best place to uh, to find you and to find your work? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Clayton Snyder too, just like it sounds. And uh, my books are all on Amazon. Yes. What are you working on? What's what's coming up next for you besides uh, the collab? Uh, besides the collab, I am actually working on a new sci-fi piece, a um, little bit harder than Blackthorn. It's uh, tentatively titled Murder 9, and it is a sort of parallel universes, quantum entanglement, uh, immortality stuff. <laughs> it's, nice. Yeah, it's very... Um, it's, it doesn't really have a plot yet, but it has a crap load of world building. <laughs> so. nice. Who needs a plot? Right? <laughs> if you blow up enough shit up, you don't need a fucking plot, bro. <laughs> well, that's how it starts. So. <laughs> Uh, Mark, where's the best place to uh, to find you? And when can we expect your book? When can we get? Our oh man, that on? book! I have no idea. I have no idea when that book. I I had a very like I was kind of being strict on myself. Like, look, you have the, like X amount of time. You get it done within this time. I just feel like doing that to myself is dumb. I'm just especially after what happened. At this point, I think I just need to let everything kind of fucking happen as it's gonna happen. Don't stop. You know, try to be vigilant and, and keep the ball rolling. Don't fucking lay down and, and let collect dust you know but uh there's no i have no clue i would like to be done with it by like sometime next year 
is what it would be nice to be done with it. I mean, I have a like a, probably a quarter of it, like still, you know, so it won't be too bad. I'm like, is that right? Yeah, I'm shooting for about 80,000 words, somewhere 60 to 80,000. So we'll see if I get there. Hopefully by next year, I'll be done. And if uh, in the meantime, you can find me on the Slowly Red channel there on YouTube. Uh, just put in slowly red. You'll find my goofy ass. Uh, the one thing is I am getting ready for a move though. So, I mean, I might, the way my channel is right now is so weird. I'm like, kind of like here, I'm not here. I haven't really dropped a book review in a minute. I've been doing some live chats. I'm just doing what I can to kind of keep people in the loop, I guess, but I'm not giving up on anything. I'm just kind of trying to make do with what I got in such a like crazy time i got four kids you know and we're all moving so that the household is nuts right now oh yeah well you did just post a blackthorn review a couple of it was a yes yes i yeah. did and you yeah. guys can check that out i suggest you do go check it out and grab that book because that's you know it, it, it's one of the funnest fucking reads i've i've got my hands on this year you know i uh, i like quorum the michael moorcock's quorum books were one of the biggest like like my favorite reads this year and I would put fucking Blackthorn right up there with it, brother. Oh, nice. okay. I had a um, lot, of, lot, a lot of fun. Like <laughs> nothing but good things to say about that book. I do have a Discord yeah. too. Yes, I do. Yeah, slowly read Discord. And, Where uh, those guys are kicking ass on there. I've been so kind of absent, and they're just they keep the ball rolling while while I'm doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what are you uh, What are you reading now, Mark? What are, What's on your Oh, uh, I just got done reading, well, rereading The White Luck Warrior because I'm doing the re, uh, the read thing with Jimmy and Amanda. So we're just going to be discussing that this weekend, I think. Uh, and I kind of broke back into the Silmarillion. I wanted, mm. I love that book so much. The world building, everything's so beautiful. And uh, like, I don't, like I say, I don't really know if it's Guy Gabriel Kay's descriptions in that book or if it's Tolkien's or just a mixed mesh of both, but some of that writing in there is so epic it just it hits you hard and powerful in the best ways and i love that book is it the most like is it the easiest read no but i think that the work versus reward is very much there and the cool thing about already having read it is i can literally like pick it up read a bit of it and put it down and it's no big deal you know uh but i do have a western on the on the horizon mr mark lawrence stopped by one of my uh live streams and he uh, suggested Deadwood, and I've seen the TV show. I didn't actually even know it was adapted out of a book, so I'm probably going to be reading Deadwood here pretty soon because I do love westerns. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Mike, where can people find you in your work? Or what can we? Exp- what What are you working on? Uh, yeah, for finding me, the usual shit: Twitter, <laughs> Fletcher Mr, MichaelRFletcher dot com. Just Google Michael R. Fletcher. I'm there. Uh, I just sent a book, uh, The Storm Beneath the World, off to my editor. Uh, it's a non-human fantasy, so there are no humans. It doesn't take place on any secondary Earth or anything. It's basically me thinking, what if an alien race wrote a fantasy novel? And then I wrote that. Um, so it's kind of got nothing to do with humans, uh, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. Uh, up next, I've got the collaboration with Clayton going, um, this morning I started tinkering around with the first book in the next, uh, Obsidian Path trilogy. And then there's a, yeah, I got a lot of shit I want to do. <laughs> I've got more books to, that I want to write than I have time to write them. So I'm keeping busy. So Manifest Illusions book three, 2023. We can uh, I hope so. Yeah, it should be, awesome. should be uh, next year. Awesome. Yeah. Right on. Well, thanks, uh, thanks to all of, all of you for coming by. I'm I'm always shocked whenever I get so, so many people in one time. Really appreciate your time. I know you're all busy and have books to write, or YouTube videos to make, or moving to do. So, thanks to all of you for uh, for hanging out and just shooting the breeze. So, yeah, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having us. us. Yeah. And thanks to yeah, everyone who came early, by. Brother. Thanks for having us, Steve. Yeah, anytime. Uh, thanks for everyone who came by in the chat to uh, have some laugh, laughs with us. It's always fun when people drop by and interact with us. Everyone have a good weekend. All right.